Good evening, everyone. Thank you, President, Officers of the Union, for inviting me this evening to, I think it's Oxford. Delighted to be back in the Union some 30 years after my last visit. Um, and that was an equally interesting experience. Um, maybe I'll be telling people who was also in the debating chamber with me that day. Um, I come to you as a Canterbridgean, so a little bit nervous in front of you, not quite sure whether I'll get out of the building alive. Uh, but I can assure you I had all the vaccinations and inoculations that I need, so I haven't brought any terrible illnesses from the fens that any of you are not immune to, so you should be and ought to be fine. The proposition in front of us this evening is a very interesting one, and we've heard some excellent arguments from the opposition, uh, sorry, yes, the opposition, Chloe and uh, Lord Hanan. And the proposition is that this house would prioritize economic equality over economic growth. And I'm going to ask you all to open your eyes when you vote later on today. Open your eyes and see what's going around you in this country. Ask yourself the question before you vote about what is the most important thing that we have to do as a country following the experiences that we have gone through in the last quarter of a century. I'll just ask you to think about that for a second and then I'll go in to my main points. Of course, and we've been told this, growth is very important. Last month I published a paper in the Economic History Review looking at GDP in the long run, in the long durée. In 1700, the, in constant terms, the income per head in av on average was 1,650 pounds in today's terms. In 2020, it was 30,000 pounds, a 17-fold increase. And the opposition would argue that that has generated better health, longevity, one of the most wonderful things that we have. We're able to see our, children, our parents as children and get to know them later on in life and understand the transfer of knowledge. It's the most important thing that we have in front of us in a way that previous generations have never been able to do. Law and order has improved over that long run. It's a much less violent society that we have in front of us than we had in the past. Democracy has developed, believe it or not. It has, it's moved on. We have more questioning of the democratic officials. We have institutions that are independent, providing scrutiny, the press, and even social media all play a very important role in transferring your views into decision-making of policy. All of that sounds like a good thing. All of that sounds like something that we should ha want to have and that growth has delivered to us. Peace, apart from the horrendous invasion of Ukraine by Putin this time last year, the European continent benefited from peace throughout my lifetime. That, of course, is also something that we might say is a result of growth. Education, mass education, whether it's at universities or elsewhere, has also happened, we are told, as a function of growth. And yet, and also, actually, I've missed inequality. One of the great trends that we've seen in the 20th century was a reduction in wealth inequality and a reduction in income inequality. And the people opposite would tell us that that is a function of growth. But unfortunately, they've got it all the wrong way around. It's successive governments that have tackled these critical issues over time, whether it's the Great Reform Act of 1832, the agreements that we had after World War II to guarantee peace in our lifetime, the Beveridge Report that guaranteed full employment and education and the health service, these were the preconditions of economic growth. These were governments and policymakers and politicians fighting often against the forces of conservatism to bring about progressive change in an economy that led to better lives for most people. Why not? Is it 
Uh, you're going around in circles. I've been very clear that growth is not the thing that's driving all those public goods that I listed. That it's the consistent and careful addressing of those issues by successive waves of people who cared about them that have brought about a better society than would otherwise have been the case. And that is the contention I want you to think about, not only today, but for the rest of your career and the rest of your life. You need to do what is right. And to work out what is right, you need to open your eyes and see what the problems are and address those problems. Growth is the byproduct of a society and a set of individuals doing the right thing time and time again. And that is where, in fact, I'm sorry to say, as a society, we have fallen down in the last quarter of a century. And that's the main reason why our economic growth has lagged that of our trading partners and um, has lagged our previous historical performance. There was a time, I'm proud to say, this country was at the forefront of social and economic reform and change. And now it is not. And I think that is the main cause of the slowdown in growth that we're suffering. So I would say don't focus on growth, focus on the right thing. And let me take an example, it's a hypothetical example, of a government that decides to target growth. Just imagine there's a government that comes in without having won a general election. Let's suppose the Prime Minister and the Chancellor say, we'll adopt a growth target. The growth target we'll adopt is far and above a higher than the capacity of the economy to grow at that rate. Let us suppose they adopt a target of 2.5%. And let us suppose the target in the economy or the achievable rate of growth is 1%. Let us suppose that self-same government targets growth to such an extent it doesn't want to take any advice from the Office of Budget Responsibility, the Bank of England. It gets rid of the top of the Treasury. It, doesn't, it does so little that the National Institute of Economic and Social Research had to sit down and explain all the problems with that growth strategy and consistently throughout the whole of the autumn. Now, of course, that would never happen. We'd never have that. It would just never happen in this country that we'd have such an idea happening. Because if you target growth, you end up doing the wrong things. And I'm asking us all to think about the right thing. Let me give you another example of a country that targeted growth. Five-year plans, collectivization, the Soviet Union. If we put growth above everything else, we will stop doing the right things for people out there. The targeting of growth that we've had in the country has been driven by low interest rates, that's increased asset prices, that's meant that those who've had favorable initial conditions have benefited over that period. Those without those favorable initial conditions, and people in this room, I'm happy to say, you've already largely won. I'll come to you in just a second. You can keep standing, it's good for you. <laughs> Uh, people in this room have already, mostly already won the game of life. You're at the second best university in the world. <laughs> and I want to congratulate you for that. But me uh, no, no, I think he was first. Thank you very much. I was going to say, I'm not familiar with the uh, university. Yes, sir. Five-year plans were all about economic growth and industrialization. Uh, but the Soviet Union also have um, communism. Did they not paraphrase economic policy? Uh, I'm not an expert on communism, but I know communism doesn't lead to much equality. And I'll tell you that very straight. Okay? But thank you for the question. What's happened with the economy that we've got, the growth that we've had has been through the city of London, high-value services, uh, and asset prices that have gone up has made it a country in which those without those initial conditions have been forced to work in low productivity firms, retail, um, hotels, restaurants, where wages are low. And what we've had is the development of what we now can term the working poor, where both members of the household are going out to work, but they're still not earning enough to pay the bills. And we have a large fraction of society reliant on state aid. And that is a world in which I don't think we should consider to be acceptable. What we need is the policymakers to focus on doing the right thing, create better jobs 
with higher pay so that people who are doing the right thing by going out to work can meet their bills uh, in a way that allows them not to rely on state aid. The shocks that we've had in the last 13 or 14 years, the financial crisis, the uncertainty of our relationship with Europe, COVID, the increase in energy prices, have all had an undue and amplificatory impact on income inequality and on the income of those at the bottom of the ladder. That means society has become more vulnerable, more problematic for many people. We heard a few minutes ago about how warm and well-fed we were, all are. I'm afraid that's not the case for many people in this country. Food bank usage is at a post-war high. Many people are unable to pay their food bills or their heating bills, and there is a requirement for charity and for state aid to help them. This is not the position we should be in, as we were sold by the opposition, as the sixth richest economy in the world. I've been director of the National Institute for seven years in May, and I've opened my eyes to all the problems that I'm seeing as I go around the country that need to be addressed as a priority. It is a question of doing the right thing. And I finish, if I may, with the words of one of my heroes, Gil Scott Heron, who died 12 years ago in May, who was asked, if you can do something for someone, why not do it? And that's what he said just before he died. So I would say to you all, if you can help people who are suffering from inequality and an inability to meet their bills, why not help them? Thank you very much.